Okay, today we are honored to have uh, John Wu from Rutgers Department of Physics to present on uh, deep learning in astrophysics, galaxy scaling relations. Okay, awesome. Cool, well thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm excited to tell you about uh, the marriage of two disciplines that I, that I love. Uh, so I'm uh, at the physics and astronomy department here. Um, and I study basically how galaxies form, how they evolve, and how they continue to grow. And then, uh, more recently, I've been interested in applying deep learning methods uh, in hopes of understanding some of the phenomena that we observe. So, uh, let's get started here. First, I'm just going to begin with like an astronomy 101. Um, basically, how do galaxies form and, and what are they up to? Well. This is basically like the greatest hits of the universe here. Um, so early in the universe, basically we believe there's a big bang and then it rapidly uh, expands and it's currently even accelerating as it expands. Um, but in doing so, the universe, uh, the energy is conserved and thus the energy density is actually uh, dropping uh, very quickly as you know, the volume increases. And so, Whereas in the early universe, we expect that the energy density is very high and there are quantum fluctuations. Basically, there are just random uh, you know, pair creation and annihilation events going on where, uh, with matter. Um, that matter is eventually frozen in, essentially, um, after um, a couple hundred thousand years uh, into the universe. Uh, and most of that matter is actually going to be hydrogen. Um, very little of it is going to be any of the heavier elements you can imagine because in the early universe, you have subatomic particles sort of uh, bouncing around and, and whatnot. But um, as the temperature drops, as the energy drops, uh, you end up with um, this basically this uh, this matter. Uh, all the quarks get confined into protons and neutrons, and then those basically combine to form just hydrogen, helium, and happen so quickly. Uh, and then the electrons bond into with them. Uh, and recombine that you basically do not form any other heavy elements. So basically, for all intents and purposes, the, the primordial inter, uh, you know, just the gas that's, that's dispersed around the universe is, is all just hydrogen and helium. And that's going to become important later. So as uh, we just see this, you know, hydrogen and helium floating around, this is what's called the dark ages here. Uh, but then gravity is still taking effect this whole time. And once more, there's also dark matter. We believe that 80% of the mass in the universe is uh, in the form of dark matter, which means that it doesn't emit photons and it doesn't seem to interact with our ordinary protons and electrons and such. Um, but it's there and it does interact gravitationally. And, and that becomes very important because it forms, because it collapses under the influence of gravity, protons and you know, hydrogen and all these atoms are also falling into the same gravitational potentials due to um, just due to the force of gravity and um, that's what enables the these this interstellar gas basically to form I shouldn't say interstellar there's no stars yet but this is what allows all the gas in the universe to collapse and actually um, form stars when gas becomes dense enough it is able to nuclear undergo nuclear fusion and this gas basically becomes a star so uh, stars are essentially what uh, you know are formed in galaxies, and so galaxies you can think of as factories that input uh, you know take in gas and then they output stars. They create stars. And to illustrate this further, I've got a nice simulation from uh, this collaboration, and I'm really hoping this works. All right. So here you're going to see in a moment. Uh, basically a simulation of gas uh, moving forward in time. And so the brighter colors are higher gas densities. Uh, that's what's being shown here in the purples, oranges, and yellows. This little panel here shows a zoomed in view of the center where the galaxy is actually going to form. And remember that all around this, there is dark matter. And that's actually shown here. We wouldn't be able to see the dark matter for certain, you know, with our telescopes. Nor would we really be able to see much of this gas since it's just atomic gas. It's not really like, uh, it's not very bright, it doesn't glow. But what is shown in this panel here um, as time evolves is uh, the stars that have formed from the densest pockets of gas. And so if we were to look at you know, this galaxy, uh, again, moving forward in time, we'd see that at this point it has now formed a rotating disk. Uh, basically due to conservation of angular momentum, it 
all the gas wants to go and form some structure like this, basically a, a two-dimensional disk. I'm going to pause right here and, and just say what's being shown here now uh, in green and, and uh, yellows is actually now these stars, just as galaxies are factories that turn gas into stars, stars are actually factories that turn all the, the, the hydrogen and the helium in the beginning of the universe, and then on, with nuclear fusion, they actually synthesize these heavier elements. And so that's where basically all of the carbon and nitrogen, oxygen, you know, silicon, iron, all these things come from. They come from uh, the, the centers of stars, where it's very dense and it's able to undergo nuclear fusion. So what's shown here now is basically the abundance of these heavy elements relative to the lighter elements. And so purple basically on this side out here, where no stars have yet been able to basically form, there are no you know, real heavy elements, but sort of at the center of this galaxy, only on the left side here, where it's in yellow, that's basically where a lot of these heavy elements have formed. So, a density plot, right? That's, yeah, so the, this is a density plot. This is actually basically a logarithmically scaled uh, plot of the, basically the fractional abundance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, out of all, you know, if one, if you want to add up to one all the uh, fractions of the different elements, and so this is like, all the heavy elements here. And we have here basically taking into account gravity influences. That's right. So gravity is taken into account here. Actually, there are also magnetic fields being like included in the simulation. There's a lot of uh, other things, radiative transfer, you know, turbulent dynamics, and things like that. Um, this uh, collaboration called Illustrious, uh, the Next Generation, is is basically a, a a very very high resolution simulation. So they they've included a lot of interesting things going on here. And um, you can see sort of, oh, by the way, I should say, up here, there's this little number that's counting down. That's the cosmological redshift. And so this basically just means, you know, you can think of it as like the opposite of the inverse of time to some extent. So at redshift of infinity, at z of infinity, our very high number, it's basically when the universe was just born. And at redshift close to zero, that's the present day. And so here we go. This galaxy, you can see. This is basically the disk of the galaxy where all the stars and the densest portions of the gas is. Uh, there are infalling satellite galaxies and dwarf galaxies. And you can also see sort of on, on this over here, you can see that there's actually a count, two more counters here showing, I don't know if you can read this, but this is the star formation rate. And this is the amount of stellar mass, basically the total amount of stars uh, in the galaxy or the, the mass of the stars in the galaxy. And so those are increasing, well, the stellar mass is increasing because it's turning all this gas into stars. And the rate at which you know, gas is being turned into stars, that's the star formation rate. So um, let's go and do you have any more questions, actually? So the M star and M circle? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. So, M, OK. Log, so this is basically a log of M star in units of uh, the, the mass of the sun. So this basically means that right now there's 10.7, which is like, I don't know, a couple hundred billion times the mass of our sun worth of stars in this galaxy. And star formation rate is in units of basically solar masses per year. How many, basically in one year, maybe six, six times the mass of our sun is converted into gas, or into, into stars. Um, cool. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I was trying to hit all the different <laughs> panels going on in this uh, simulation, which which I did not make, uh, but some, um, let's go forward now. Uh, okay, here's another, you know what, I'm gonna, well, actually, this I think this is illustrative for other reasons, but this is another simulation. It's quite dark, I see, but you basically have, um, again, gas, but now the colors show basically the velocity of the gas. And so um, you have to remember that the, the universe is expanding, which means that, you know, certain, you know, gas that is at a certain velocity uh, is actually at moving at a different speed relative to us because gas that's far away from you know the Milky Way or the Earth is actually move, is receding from us due to the expansion of the universe. And so here you can see this gas basically all collapsing in this filamentary structure, um, which we saw a hint of before. Um, and in fact, if you look closely, you can kind of see that there are little jets of gas being expelled out of some of these galaxies. And so, and likewise here too. 
And so this is basically due to the effects, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the effects of supernova and a, an accreting supermassive black hole at the center of these galaxies. And so these are just extreme phenomena that really can impact how a galaxy evolves. So it's trying to form stars out of this gas, but then you have these very energetic phenomena. And now we've actually just gone to the stellar mass view. This is nothing but stars now, rather than a gas. And you can actually see it's a, it's a little more tranquil. It don't, you don't see a whole lot of signs of that, which is interesting because you know when we first observed other galaxies it wasn't clear that they were undergoing all these explosive phenomena and so uh, those but those are really you know detrimental to basically the formation of the galaxy they those will really really se uh, severely impact how a galaxy is able to grow um, so I'm going to say a little more about that now if I can get out of this video so we can in principle move this forward in infinitely to see the predictions of the model and uh, what we, uh, what the universe would look like, say. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, the answer to that is actually it, it gets more and more boring. I see. Because the universe is continuing to accelerate as it expands. Um, you know, those those galaxies are basically consuming gas and right. turning them into stars. But at some point, you're you're really going to start running out of gas, and right. in fact, that's what we see in many uh, galaxies in the present day. Yeah. So, uh, sort of the, the cosmic, uh, some, some people call this cosmic noon, basically the highlight of, of cosmic uh, activity is it was you know, about seven or eight billion years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, it's all just on decline. Right. Okay, so to parameterize some of the things I've been talking about, uh, we can look at the star formation rate as a function of time. And so I've just drawn this squiggly curve here, which is representative of a typical galaxy, which is currently forming stars. You can see that this is time equals zero. Time increases this way, and uh, redshift again goes the other way. Uh, so then the star formation rate is basically now shown. I'm, I'm writing psi here in this red curve. And you can see that right now it's got some non-zero star formation rate, and in the past it might have been higher or lower. Uh, and this is kind of typical of what we would like to know about a galaxy, because this is actually, we'll say, a pretty important curve. Um, if we think about the total stellar mass that's been uh, produced inside a galaxy, well, it's really just the area under the curve, modulo some fraction of mass which has been stuck in black holes forever, or even stuck in stars. There are some very long-lived stars, uh, or I'm sorry, sorry, not stars, uh, so stuck in black holes or possibly ejected out. Uh, for, you know, into the, basically, in between the, the medium and, and the space in between galaxies, which is kind of like what you had seen in that previous simulation, this gas is being expelled at high velocities. So, the, you know, this curve is actually really useful for us who want to start, you know, for, we want to study uh, galaxy evolution because, you know, we care about whether or not a galaxy is currently star forming, is that time equals zero, and also, we would really like to know what the full curve is, like what was its history of being able to form stars, since that's primarily you know, what we're interested in. But in order to study this further, too, we need to understand what are the processes you know, that happen after stars are immediately formed. So, as I said, stars fuse mostly hydrogen helium into heavier elements. And so here I've got a chart of just you know, four uh, typical types of stars. This is kind of like our sun, so this is about the same mass as our sun, and basically all, all we know about, um, about stellar evolution and stuff really depends on the mass of the, the star. So that's basically like, you know, a sun-like star is basically a star that has the mass of our sun. A supergiant star is going to have something like 10 to 30 times, maybe even 100 times the, the mass of our sun, and they evolve quite differently. Due to their high masses, supergiant stars actually fuse uh, hydrogen, helium, and then heavier elements at an extremely high rate and thus have very, very short lifetimes. They are also, you know, they also expel tons of energy because of the radiation pressure because of, you know, these, uh, these processes of nuclear fusion are energetically favorable, so they're blowing out lots of energy. That energy can couple to light and mass, and so that mass is actually ejected outward throughout the lifetime of the star. Um, and then it finally, uh, basically, it is unable to continue fusing elements that are uh, basically more, uh, more massive than, than iron, because iron is the most stable element. And so after it basically fuses up to iron in the center of these supergiant cores, they are unable to sustain the energetic you know, uh, pressure in order to keep themselves from collapsing gravitationally. And thus they just 
basically fall into either a black hole or a neutron star. But in doing so, there's also like there's a supernova that goes off, and thus um, the, the heavy elements, these basically new uh, enriched elements, I'm going to say, uh, are thrown into the surrounding interstellar medium. Some like stars are uh, have slightly different evolutions, but they basically are also fusing these heavier elements, and then over time, much longer times, in fact, 10 billion years or so. Uh, they basically shed off their outer layers and blow those into the interstellar medium. So they also do this nucleosynthetic enrichment. Um, so nucleosynthesis is basically how these heavy elements form. And just to be clear, uh, this is like this is basically how astronomers view uh, chemistry. You basically have a lot of hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and basically n almost nothing of anything else. And so. Uh, astronomers are fond of calling everything metals. Uh, so carbon is a metal, you know, beryllium is a metal, but you know, oxygen is a metal, whatever, and whatever you want. Um, we call this metals uh, because, well, because frankly, there's so little of it. Uh, it's you know less than 0.1 percent of the universe by mass. But uh, also because we, you know, they're kind of all produced from similar processes through these nuclear fusion events. And there, and there are, you know, different stars do create different types of elements, and so this is important. But from the standpoint of galaxy evolution, all we really care about is how much metals or heavy elements do we have relative to hydrogen. So I'm going to define this term, which we call metallicity, and this is like an official term. Uh, metallicity is just the abundance of heavy elements relative to hydrogen. And um, so now I'm going to throw on another curve uh, which I'm calling psi, or sorry, phi in uh, blue here, and this is, and so phi is basically the chemical enrichment or nucleosynthesis uh, history of uh, of a galaxy. And as you would expect, since stars are the ones that actually create these heavy elements, the heavy element abundance must be a function of the star formation rate or somehow related to it. So the metallicity is basically the integrated, you know, chemical enrichment history. And the chemical enrichment history, in turn, is uh, what we call a delay time distribution. Basically, it's a function, you know, it's, as I said, a function of the star formation history. Although, you know, since we saw that different types of stars live to different ages, there's a kind of a spectrum of times over which you've got uh, heavy elements entering the interstellar medium. Okay. Uh, Yes. When you say that these, these values, m star and z, are proportional, mm -hmm. uh, what is it, what is that, what, is there like a normalizing constant that you're not talking about? Or what? Yeah, this is super uh, simplified, but, but yes, uh, so, so as I said, so like in, for the stellar mass, m star, this can be, you know, some of it can get stuck in the black hole, some of it can actually get just, you know, some of the mass that is formed in stars, like over the star's lifetime will, Get blown out of the galaxy, um, and it will get sent, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of light years away. Uh, and because it's so supernova, um, these accreting supermassive black holes, um, which you saw in that simulation again with these jets of material being thrown out of galaxies, those are the kinds of events that um, might decrease, make this sort of less than one. There's a normalization factor. Is this normalization factor? I mean. Is this M star something that changes over time? That's a good question. And yes, in, 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 I mean, in our, uh, I mean, in our current model, I'm not factoring that in, into account. But that's actually a, a genuine concern. As uh, there's a, a couple of different reasons for why it could be changing over time, or whether or not it should be. Um, but the short of it is that right now, people believe that there's something called a. a universal initial mass function and the idea is that anytime you form stars into or you form stars out of gas there is basically a constant distribution function of uh, with the, in terms of what how many stars form according to their masses you know what masses they are therefore the relative abundance of high mass stars and low mass stars that form out of a parcel of gas that's constant that doesn't change basically over time uh, but that's a that's kind of a big assumption to make, and um, most folks who who you know approach this don't think that it changes, and there's no observational evidence they would say that really supports that. But then there are others who say that there you know this actually does change and it should change, 
um, if you were to sort of go through the detailed, you know, whatever, if you, if you were to basically model these and, and uh, simulate them. Uh, One more question. I'm sure yeah, this yeah. is a, maybe a bit of a technical question, but I guess I found if m is just a constant, mm -hmm. so it's not dependent on time. In, in your in your as far as this is oh. written, mm -hmm. and if it's proportional to something, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, I mean, in what sense are you using the word proportional here? Because every number is proportional to every other number. Right? <laughs> so I guess that's what I'm trying to. Understand. I see. Yes. I what I uh, I guess what I really mean is that M here is is integrally tied to this curve. Okay. That we've drawn. Um, so is it you know is it approximately this integral? Is that a way? Yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry. So it, it sh you could basically stick like a constant normalizing factor out there for the purpose of this model. So we'll just say, you know, I don't know, one over x, and that, or I don't know, one over constant, right? Like, and and, and that and that uh, we can assume is constant. And then there's another different constant factor in terms of what z is. Again, it's proportional, but now this, you know, there's other reasons why metals can get stuck, you know, either uh, inside stars or inside a black hole or, you know, forever far away from galaxies. But basically, we think that, you know, you know, to sort of first order approximation, this is this is what how you would write it out. Yeah. Now, this, I mean, this is a good point because I think that like having a bad model, you know, if if you have a terrible model, then of course what you get out and you know, when you put your data in and try to constrain it is, is going to be some terrible uh, results. What is the lag function? I'm sorry? What is the nuclear synthesis lag function? Yeah, I mean, so this kind of is in some ways like just like a 1D correlation. Like you're, you're basically saying that, you know, if, if there's like some F which uh, you can think of F as almost like, um, like a probability distribution function with sort of some sort of, you know, uh, based on tau and, and based on how far t is from tau, then you know how much of the stars do you expect to uh, be producing metals or at least return those metals uh, back into the gas. So, um, so right. So you would expect you know if you if there's a large population of of these stars, then then you know we would expect that at 10 million years right after you form the stars, you would expect a lot of supernova to go off and therefore uh, you know your your phi to basically increase at that point. But before then you actually don't expect any metals to have formed. Right? So there's like a lag is what I'm basically trying to say. But not all of it is happening at exactly 10 million years, right? It's not a delta function, it's actually uh, there's kind of a distribution because you know upwards of there there are stars that live like a trillion years, right? And and we we know that they're not gonna go supernova or or, or really do much at all for a long time. And so um, those elements are never going to be returned to the interstellar medium. By the way, what determines whether a supernova goes to black hole or a neutron star? Um, basically, just the mass okay. of the star. Yeah. And neutron star is going to stay as a neutron star, or uh, uh, black hole in the end? It is, but I guess th they can also they can actually merge. Uh -huh. So for so there was this well publicized you know merger event of, of neutron stars. Right. right? I see. And. Um, we don't really know how frequent those are, but th that's actually a, a completely new domain for right. astrophysics. Um, but uh, yeah. Anyway, so um, right, so we've got our simple model here now uh, with three quantities that we can, we are able to measure, I should say. So what's important to note is that these curves we cannot actually measure this, right? We have to model them somehow. We can either simulate them and forward model them and constrain them against. Them these observables, but the real observables are star formation rate, stellar mass, and uh, the metallicity of the galaxy. And so, you know, here's some examples of, of galaxies that we can see. Uh, these are both pretty nearby, and um, what we find is that, you know, for this galaxy here, which is, you know, I know these are just kind of random numbers here, but this is basically, you know, a thousand times less massive than our own Milky Way, this one on the left here. It's it's very blue and, and kind of purple, which basically means that it's got a, a lot of ultraviolet and blue radiation. Those that radiation is from very massive energetic stars. What that really means is that, and because we know that massive energetic stars actually go supernova in about 10 million years, it means that it's had a fresh burst of star formation within basically the last 10 million years. Um, you know, so 
it's uh, got basically, you know, a, this turns out to be a low metallicity, around eight. Um, I'll, I'll show more plots with better normalizing factors, but so, so basically what we see here is this is a low mass and low metallicity galaxy. And it kind of is this bluish color. Um, on, the, on the right, I'm kind of contrasting this now with another pretty nearby galaxy. Um, it's about 100 times as massive as the one on the left, and in fact, its metallicity is much higher as well. And this is kind of to be expected, right? So if, if it's four more stars over its lifetime, it's probably also produced more heavy elements in its lifetime, and so that's what we're observing here. Um, the thing I should stress too, though, is that actually when we make these measurements, it's based on like the integral, great integrated um, colors. Basically, how much blue light is there? How much green light? How much red light is there? Uh, but it's not basically it's not based on the morphology of these galaxies. And part of the reason is that it's really difficult to quantify the morphology, basically the shapes of these galaxies. And so most um, current you know astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, research doesn't take into account a lot of uh, morphological features when we want to model some of their other uh, some of their other properties. Uh, Z here is measured by a technique called spectroscopy. Um, basically, you're looking at the diffraction of, of light, uh, you know, through um, a grating, and basically this tells you how much energy you have at certain wavelengths. Basically, like, and and what this allows you to do is is really measure the the abundance of certain elemental species. And since we care about the heavy elements, that's, that's what we're after there. And the thing to keep in mind there is that spectroscopy is super, super expensive. Like it takes a lot more telescope time. You know, at least, um, you know, you go basically at least a, a factor of five in brightness or so, uh, and, and thus, you know, a factor of 25 or so in time. Uh, do you, do you yeah. just take lots of images and spectroscopy on the images itself, or do you have a a particular kind of telescope to do spectroscopy. Yeah, so there are these particular instruments. Um, generally, there's, there's a technique called long slit spectroscopy, and so uh -huh. basically across a, a slit, you 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 know are basically casting the diffractive light. You, there are actually very recently uh, there's been development in integral field spectroscopy, which uh -huh. is basically at every single pixel you are able to right. take a spectrum. Now that that takes a lot of time, um, uh -huh. and it's and it's very hard to do for you know, distant and faint objects and things like that. And you can only take it for one, you know, one galaxy at a time. The, for, you know, when I say color here, I really mean photometry. Basically, you can take a wide, you know, uh, wide view of the sky, and you can get, you know, thousands of galaxies all at once. Right. And for spectroscopy, you're generally not able to do that sort of thing. So, um, so anyway, so, so all of our, uh, you know, Galaxy evolution is going to be dependent on, on how well we can measure these things and how, how many of these galaxies we can obtain spectroscopy or, or photometry for. Um, I've just shown some sample sort of star formation and chemical enrichment history curves for you know, what I think a galaxy like this may look like. What you're saying basically the star formation rate is, is kind of on the rise and same with the chemical enrichment for this one on the left. And this is because it's blue and thus forming new stars. The one on the right is, is redder, especially in the central region, so it's redder. Um, it's already had a lot of mass formed, uh, but sort of the fact that it's redder actually suggests that most of the, the blue, very massive stars have, have supernova. They, they've died, and since they're no longer present, you know, um, they are no longer there to emit that energetic radiation. So at ultraviolet wavelengths and stuff like this, this would not be super bright. Um, and so maybe the star formation history for this would be rising at some point where it did form a lot of stars, but then sort of since then it's been declining. This is kind of also typical from simulations. Um, but the chemical enrichment in terms of stars going supernova and stuff like that, that is, you know, that's some sort of a function. We're not exactly sure how to parameterize it, but you know, this is a function that uh, is, is a time-like distribution of, of the other one. Um, and we do know that the total amount of uh, basically Z here is, is high relative uh, to, uh, to the galaxy on the left. And so it's unsurprising that there's this, what I'm going to call scaling relation, which basically just means galaxies that have more of one thing have more of a lot of other things. And so, you know, galaxies that have more stars tend to be brighter. Galaxies that have more stars in this case tend to be higher in metallicity. Um, and this is actually, you know, this is not. I should say that this is not a trivial finding. Like you know, astronomy has been around 
this has been the science for a, a very long time, hundreds of years, uh, but really one of the big uh, confirmations of this particular scaling relation came uh, only 15 years ago uh, in what we call the mass metallicity relationship, which is just, as you can imagine, a correlation between the stellar mass and the metallicity of galaxies. Um, part of the reason why this took so long is because it's very hard, as I said, to, to get spectroscopy. And so here's you know, our two galaxies here. They're, I, I don't even know if I put them in the right place, but generally speaking, the lower mass galaxies are these sort of bluer, uh, smaller galaxies, and the ones um, you know, that are more massive tend to be higher metallicity and they're redder. And so this is kind of like what has been observed. In terms of um, a visible origin for the scatter, the, the mass metallicity relationship, um, you know, as you said, the, the way that we parameterize our model really matters, or how, how we construct our model, it really matters. Um, and so if there's scatter in this relationship, you know, the question is, is it coming from a physical origin? Is it coming from another origin? So one possible physical origin that we might um, think is, is the physics of how these heavy elements are synthesized and what dictates uh, the fraction of them that get returned back into the surrounding gas in the galaxy, you know, or what fraction of them gets blown out forever, never to return. Um, that basically is going to dictate, you know, what uh, basically, the height and sort of how, how far the time lag is of this blue curve, the enrichment curve, relative to the star formation history curve. There's also, of course, the possibility that, um, you know, there's also, of course, possibilities that we didn't measure uh, psi, the star formation history or current star formation rate, very well, and so our constraints from uh, the observables are not very good. Um, alternatively, you know, uh, you know, our, our models just might not be correct, right? Like, so we, we might have a wrong normalization factor here. We may not know um, if it's really a function, whether we're probing the nucleosynthesis this lag function that I mentioned, or if it's just an overall effect here. But what we do need to know is what the scatter is in that mass metallicity relationship. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna now shift to the methodology with introduction in deep convolutional neural networks. So, um, Eddie, I know you have some <laughs> done some work in Cogsci, so definitely correct me if I say anything wrong here. Um, you know, so artificial neural networks uh, are loosely inspired by biological neural networks, which uh, in you know which the building block is going to be uh, just a neuron like this one that's shown here on the left, and. You know, neurons, they take some sort of input signal, which I guess goes through the dendrites, and is somehow processed and results in a uh, sort of, uh, uh, I guess, an output signal through the axon. And, and I believe this is through some sort of electrical you know, mechanism. But the point is that these neurons can be combined, and uh, the, the resulting effect of what they're able to do far exceeds that which you know, seems obvious from just a single neuron or, you know. And so when we look at an image of, for example, this here is the brain and different activations within the brain, you can actually see that, you know, uh, there are layers and portions of the brain which are, have actually been able to do, you know, specified tasks. And so this area here that's lit up is like near the occipital lobe. And so this is useful in terms of vision, you know, in biological uh, for humans, really. And there are layers of the brain, or, or basically these portions of the brain that you know have uh, individual tasks. And I think we're only now uncovering, you know, how how they all work together. Uh, but you know, analogously, we have these artificial neurons, which really just take in an input signal as before. Um, they're sewn together, and then they are actually they go through an activation function here, uh, and then they're basically output. So to break this down a little bit, you, uh, the, what's happening in the cell body here, this, this artificial neuron, is that you know, there are some weights associated with a particular model. You basically are just multiplying a weight times the input uh, for a various set of inputs. Um, and then you are summing them up, adding a bias term, which is just a constant term, um, and then processing it through an activation function. One reason why we care about this activation function, by the way, is that, um, you know, so biologically, you know that uh, 
not all your neurons are always firing, right, all the time with like, you know, various different intensities. There's, it's thought that, you know, the, a neuron is, needs a certain threshold before it actually fires and, and sends out an output. And so similarly, we are interested in, in not having all of our neurons, our artificial neurons basically, like, you know, sending out signals nonstop, but there's an activation function, you know, above some threshold, which there is an output that's sent out. Um, from the per, you know from the standpoint of like actually creating these things, we we also realize that the activation function is needs to be a nonlinear function, and that nonlinearity is what allows basically any sort of representation um, of of different functions. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. But um, yeah, and so so also analogous to sort of portions of the brain doing different things. Uh, we think that you know it, it's a smart way to build an artificial neural network by putting groups of these neurons, artificial neurons, together in what we call a layer, and that basically you know it then passes things uh, to sort of a second set of neurons, which you know can take the inputs from the, the first layer, and this is called a hidden layer because it's in between the input and the output layers, and then finally produce some sort of an output. Um, Right, so I mentioned that you know neural networks are able to approximate functions, and, and this is kind of the, the real power of them, uh, which is this is the same thing above, uh, but it you know has been proven actually that if you have a sufficiently wide hidden layer, you can approximate any function you know that you want. And the caveat though is that that function might not be particularly elegant or you know particularly generalizable. It just so happens to be that you know you're, you basically have chosen a set a, you know a set of basis functions which are represented by each of these neurons acting as a, a particular function, and then your final output is just going to be whatever you want it to be. Um, and so here's an example basically of uh, dividing sort of light from dark colored dots. And so if you have a, certain, a sufficient number of hidden neurons, you can make all sorts of weird jaggedy separators and boundary lines that you know do the job for you, but they're obviously this is you know this is not something that you think would be a generalizable approach to separating the, the dark from the, the light colored neurons here. So when you say twenty hidden neurons, are you is that one hidden layer with twenty neurons or, or yes. twenty layers? Okay. So this in this case it's twenty hidden neurons, yeah, in one layer. Um, and I guess Maybe you'll talk about this, maybe you won't, but uh, in practice, um, the, the, the situation on the right, um, how do you know if you're in that situation? Uh, I mean, you can look at it in yeah. this case. But, you know. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so in practice, the best way to do this is to reserve some of your data uh, as a validation set. And so you, you, want, you want to be able to make sure you're not overfitting your data, right, um, as, as you've done here. Um, I think that this is. It, it depends on what field you're in because uh, in certain fields I think you almost never actually are able to achieve overfitting. It, this is you know so in computer science where you where um, you know computer scientists have been working with uh, certain data sets that they've you know gotten very very good at fitting and very good at you know mass you know optimizing uh, their networks to to do you know a variety of tasks. But in some fields like in astronomy, it's actually uh, quite difficult to reach over the overfitting stage. You have to really put a lot of work in to come up with anything that will get the job done. And so, um, so this is kind of, there's kind of a trade-off here because like some people are, are definitely scared about coming up with models that are not generalizable. And in my case, uh, I often struggled with the other, you know, the other problem, which is that I can't get any model to even come close to, you know, producing useful, you know, a useful representation. Um, Although, although I, I did in the end, but you know, I'll, I'll just say that it, it's it's a more challenging problem than it seems. Um, yeah. So okay, right. So because we're interested, in, and I'll say more about this too in a bit. Uh, in I'm interested in imaging tasks, basically taking advantage of the fact that we have all these beautiful images of galaxies, but we oftentimes just reduce it to something like the integrated light or something like that. Uh, I want to make use of convolutions, uh, and so really all a convolution is, it's, you know, it's very simple, um, is that it's just a, basically a dot product, you basically see, you have a filter, which is shown in this sort of darker region here, and represented as this function g, you have an input, 
image, in this case a five by five and one channel image, uh, which I represent as F, and you basically just scan over portions of that image and you say, how much is this dark region, this, uh, this filter or kernel function, how similar is that to uh, the image in that location, right? And so you're taking an inner product, you, you, know, you call it what you want or a correlation, but you're, you're basically just saying, okay, how similar is my filter to that region of the input image? And so um, that's what a convolutional layer does, uh, is that it takes in, uh, you know, you have a set of, you have basically multiple filters, but in this case only one is being shown. Uh, in this case it's a three by three filter, and each, uh, of, it's basically a three by three matrix with weights that are parameters. This is something that you now learn, is, is these nine weights, um, as well as a bias term. And then afterwards you apply the activation function that I mentioned before. So this is the building block of a convolutional neural network, where, and uh, this is a single layer. And um, th you know, in order to make use of these things and learn well, this was sort of uh, there was a groundbreaking you know uh, paper in 2012, which is sort of when when this really became popular. You want to be able to have a set of good basis functions, or you want to have a good representation of an image, and such that you can then you know use semantically process it and think about what's, what's in the image uh, or, or you know, do a variety of other tasks. So these filters, um, you can see some of the weights here, uh, like for example, this, this is now a trained network and it's learned these sort of filters. So these are like some ripply, you know, um, basically wavelet decompositions um, or some, you know, this is just like the color green or whatever, you know, because there's a, a, you know, an image might be red, green, and blue channels, and so perhaps one of the filters that wants to learn is just to take out the green stuff, take out the yellow, or the red colors, you know, take out the blue colors, and then also look for gradients in various different colors. And this is basically the earliest, you know, layer that has been learned by this particular neural network. And you can see this is basically the inputs that were activated by, by, those, uh, by those particular filters. And this is just green stuff and various, you know, either ripply things or, or you know, uh, edges or whatever. Um, these are what's learned here. And so in layer two now, um, if you basically look onto the next layer in this deep neural network, it's actually been able to, it's learned to combine some of these things, like for instance there are edges, uh, and it's combining the edges, you know, a left edge detector with a, a upper edge detector or whatever, and it's been able to detect things like corners. So then, you know, in, in the set of images that do, are, are able to be activated, it seeks out these corners, or maybe it seeks out things like circles, um, and some various other things, or just like the color yellow, apparently. This is like what we find out that it has learned. So the, with those representations, if you move further down into this uh, trained network, uh, you find that it's able to pick up you know, more interesting semantic uh, representations of things like eyes of birds and reptiles, I guess, is what this is here. Uh, you know, unicycle wheels, apparently, with a few bicycle wheels in there. There's like some random things where it obviously is trying to mix things up a little bit, but you can see the general idea is like circular things here. It's got like people's faces, dog faces, and tires all sort of in the same thing. But these are the types of filters that it's been able to learn. And so, because, you know, these are sort of high level representations now of what's in the image. Um, and this, is, this required all the layers before to construct such a representation. Um, so this is what we're after, is the key to learning here is, is to come up with a, a good set of basis functions so that you can actually generate these high level features. So there's an algorithm for um, deep learning um, the process that we want to input stuff mm -hmm. and get some kind of um, um, generalizable pattern out of it, right? That's, that's, that's right. success criteria. Exactly. And then the, the base functions are part of the algorithm that we could build that has good projection about generalization? Um, so they're, yeah, so they're part of the, yes, I guess when you say build, yes, we, we're training, we're trying to, we're trying to optimize this, this model, mm -hmm. right, which is a very deep neural network with lots and lots of weights or parameters, whatever you want right. to call them, 
And, and yes, you're trying to optimize them such that the basis functions that they produce would yield good projections out to the sparse. Right, so training in the sense that we are kind of adjusting the parameters and the weights mm -hmm. of different kind of uh, say matrices mm -hmm. uh, such that when we're given normal data like yeah. this, you give us good output. You get the outputs that you want, that's right. I see. But there's kind of a set of, um, you know, set of things in the, the, the algorithm itself mm -hmm. which would have weights on them. It's like um, if you, you know, um, specific functions from data sets to uh, images, right, representations. Uh, I think so. Wait, can you say more though? So the, the algorithm consists in certain matrices that convert say uh, a rich image to mm -hmm. something simplified image. Okay. Right. There'll be a function from data to output, right? Yeah. And then we just have many different kinds of functions here. That's right. And the deep learning uh, process is to achieve the optimal weights over different functions. That's right. To converting some kind of images data to some output, simplified data. That's right. right. So so it's trying to optimize in that way. Uh, you have to ensure, and, and this is sort of when you come to regularization techniques and things, mm -hmm. you want you might want to ensure sparsity in some way mm -hmm. so that it is really coming up with an efficient representation. Right. So it might be optimal, but if it's right. not very generalizable, right. then it actually could be very messy. And how do you actually do the changes to the uh, algorithm? Do you do it automatically? Yeah. Or is it gonna I'll, I'll say a little bit right. about that in a moment. I but see. you basically are just going to update the weights through, well, it's, it's really just looking at how incorrect you are right, right, and the right. partial derivative of how incorrect you are right. relative to the, well, the weight. I see. In I see. So say, for example, you got a bird's eye image, mm -hmm. right? So suppose I have, you know, not round stuff, but kind of, um, uh, you know, different attention, but color and stuff, mm -hmm. not relevant. Yeah. So just say, what well, is incorrect? Yeah, so, so in fact, this all this was trained sort of with one thing in mind, and in mm -hmm. this case, I think these were trained to recognize 1,000 different categories mm -hmm. of normal things on Earth. So things like dogs, cats, trees, bicycles, clouds, right. whatever. I should say that these are actually not the, I don't think that these are the entire image. These are simply the cutouts and the regions that happen to activate that, that filter in question. But there's actually more to the image, mm -hmm. and what is actually output is not, uh, not in fact this, um, and I, it, it may, it, it, I don't even think it's this. It's basically the sort of the dot product of this with that, right? It's the, or it's the inner product. So you're 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 basically just getting a region that's lit up, saying, "Oh, I spy an eye here," you know, and and there's like a high activation there, mm -hmm. and then the rest of the map is just random noise, you know. The rest of that image is is just like whatever, you know, whatever it, it think, you know, how much it thinks that the other parts of the image align with that particular right. filter. Did it choose the most probabilistic output or among all the possible ones? Um, image or just kind of like. You're saying while optimizing? Or yeah, like, uh, in, in terms of um, when the algorithm does choose, say, the mm -hmm. output, the dot product to use. Yeah. Um, there might, might be, must be a uh, thousand possible outputs. Oh, yeah, so, so it sums all those up basically, or, or rather it passes all of those into the next layer. Right. So, you know, the fact that it. it but it doesn't it, have a circle yeah. somewhere actually right. might be important. Right. But it's always going to be a unique outcome, right? Because there's a unique kind of width um, in, in distribution of all these possible functions. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, un yeah, it's, let me think about that actually. Yes, I, I think that's correct. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So is the, um, uh, so you're, what you're doing is you're optimizing with respect to a certain, a particular loss function. Right. Yes, yeah. Um, now, after you get these weights, mm -hmm. um, let's say I have a, a new input. Right. So I want to use that to do whatever it is that you're trying to do here. But mm -hmm. um, is there a way to get the output? I guess it doesn't sound like it to me, but is there a probabilistic assessment of the output? Can you say this is probability, whatever, of being a yeah. Or? In fact, so so yes, yes, you you can do that. Um, and in this case, the way that it's trained, it, it is probabilistic. But then I think what actually happens is yeah. So it is probabilistic. That's right. And um, but then when you calculate the loss, uh, it's basically just 
one for the correct category and zero for all the others. And so, yeah, what you're getting is basically one times whatever probability it's signed. And so there's a, there's a final activation function at the way end of the network where, you know, you've done all, you've done all your convolutions and you've sort of, you know, multiplied all your weight matrices together and then you basically end up with, uh, you can create your architecture in a way that you output 1,000 different numbers. And those 1,000 numbers correspond then to the probabilities that it thinks it, this, you know, any particular image is, a, is of a particular class, right? And so, yes, so it is, it, it can be probabilistic. And the question, the, uh, what I'm going to try to do is actually a regression, not a classification problem. And so, in terms of understanding the probability of what it thinks, you know, the right, the right uh, scalar value is, it, you know, it's, there's some, I guess there are, I, I'm open to suggestions on how to like actually create a prob, you know, an actual probability uh, for, for what the final resulting value is. Does that make sense? So you, you're not going to, you're not going to get. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Um, and it's, I think, and so actually very recently, just within the you know, last couple of months, I think, you know, some astronomers have come up with interesting ways basically to drop out, like throw away certain random connections and use that as a way to sort of, you know, to sample your, you know, all the connections in your network and then come up with a probability distribution function there. Um, and, you know, there, I think some of them argue that, you know, under certain conditions it is like an approximate Bayesian computation, but I don't know if, uh, I, I haven't worked on that. But I do think it's interesting. I think that would be good because adding uncertainties to, you know, these black box algorithms is, is something that a lot of people think is important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Right, so this is what like a typical neural network looks like. And actually, this this final thing out here, I should just say, this softmax algorithm is the one that you were just interested in. Because softmax basically normalizes all the weights and, and sort of turns them into probabilities. Um, anyway, but so what's happening here is like you're, you're feeding in an image. It's three channels by, let's say, 224 by 224 pixels. Square image with three channels, red, green, and blue. And then it gets pushed into this first layer here. Uh, and the output of that, the result, and you know, uh, the result of, of uh, that comp layer is uh, 64 sort of channel, 64 different features are being sort of uh, checked up on, and then you know, the map that you get or the output you get is, is essentially a map of those features, like where did those filters, uh, you know, detect or activate. So, so then you basically have now this feature map of 64 channels by 224 by 224, and you send it to the next one, and you, and you essentially do the same thing again, um, creating the representations we just saw. And then at some point, because you don't want this to have, go out of control with a, a, you know, tons and tons of weights, you basically actually need to downsample your image. And so traditionally what's been done is that you just take sort of, you, you look at like two by two matrices and you just, throw away everything except for the, the highest value there. And I think and in practice, this has worked really well. Uh, in terms of theory, I don't think people really know why this works as well as it does. So that's kind of interesting. There's, you know, I, I, I was talking with um, another physicist and we were, we conjectured that actually like the sort of the, the variance in, uh, in, you know, taking just the maximum value is, it, it, at least in these cases, might actually be lower than if you were to just take the mean. Um, but but anyway, the point is that you can downsample and make your uh, image smaller and smaller, which is why you see it sort of narrowing in like this as you're adding more and more filters, therefore giving richer semantic you know, representations there uh, with those filters. And then finally, you basically are doing what we call a fully connected layer, or sometimes a dense layer. And so at the end, you basically have, you know, only seven by seven feature maps. These are, you know, really stretched to call them images, but they're just seven by seven, like very blurred versions of the initial input images with sort of ideas of like, here is where something is, here's where maybe a head is, and there's a, a, a wheel or a tire over there. Um, and you and those are now just collapsed into basically 4,096, you know, uh, values. And then those are all fully connected sort of in the way that we saw before. And this is kind of what a typical neural network, uh, a deep neural network looks like. 
And by the way, and I should specify that there's like 100 million weights here, just in this, this set of connections right here. So that's 100 million tunable parameters. And you know, most of our data sets don't even have a, you know, 100 million whatever uh, you know, different categories or, or anything with it. So I mean, so you basically, like, I think this is why people are worried about overfitting, because you, have, you just have so many different tunable weights. Um, here's just another idea, basically drawing the parallel between different regions of the brain uh, I, uh, can be analogously thought of as the layers in a convolutional neural network, and then they come up with sort of different feature representations. So um, I should say the, the, the way that we actually do make some of these networks trainable, as I said, like with 100 million weights, that just makes it seem like this would be computationally intractable to fit a model with 100 million plus free parameters. Um, it turns out that there's actually something that people took a while to figure out, um, but this, this paper actually does it really well, basically saying that um, if you take you know, your weights, and instead of trying to fit uh, the next layer from scratch, just from like random you know, uh, starting points, you actually have it start off as the previous layer. Uh, you basically are propagating an identity matrix, and you're only trying to fit the residual, which is close to you know, a matrix of zeros and such, rather than to basically try to fit uh, from scratch you know, something that's far away from a bunch of zeros. And this, you know, is they, they call these skip connections, or right? they're identity connections. And so this is what's called residual learning. And this has been really like, you know, causing deep learning to sort of uh, really accelerate its pace. I, I would say so in not just computer vision, but also in like speech recognition and you know like uh, you know, uh, natural language processing and, and a lot of other tasks. The idea of these residual connections is. As it has transformed the field. And to give you an idea of how insanely useful this has been, this paper, which came out two years ago, three years ago, I guess, now uh, has 21,000 citations. <laughs> and it, it's, it's really a good paper. It, it, uh, and it's very readable, because you know, I'm not a CS expert. So, why does this work so well? It really comes down to the loss landscape. The, the loss function, which I still haven't really defined, but it's basically like how far away your model predictions are from your true values. Um, this, this is basically what you take an equivalent, you know, or basically these two are the same network, but in this case you now put these skip connections in. So these residual learning basically really means that you don't have these crazy peaks and troughs all over the place. Um, this is obviously, you know, in a hundred million dimensional network, I, I think these are just two, uh, two di dimensions. I forget how they're sort of constructed, but it's either PCA or TCA or something. And so you, um, you can see that, you know, it's much more smooth. You're far less likely to get stuck in random saddle points or local, you know, suboptimal minima or anything like that. And you're able to basically get to the bottom uh, of the lost surface. And so optimization then is, is really simple. So, so here, this is like in the lost landscape. I'm going to call it J here, which is basically saying that, you know, given some model, which I call H, uh, depending on weights, you know, W and X, then um, the distance from the model prediction output uh, to Y, the true values here, uh, if you were to define a mean squared error loss function, is simply this, you know, modulo, I think. I'm off by a normalizing constant again, a one over you know, number of uh, elements in X, anyway. Uh, but this is you know, the mean squared error. Uh, and, and this is like a common loss function, which what you really care about is what does the surface look like once you, you know, according to the weights and data you have. And then also, what is the gradient of that? So this here, the gradient is simply, you know, at least for the mean squared error, it's very simple. And this just tells you like, what is the slope you know, in the you know, in direction of any particular W, any given weight. And so again, this is a super high dimensional surface, but we want to be able to find uh, the slopes at, you know, with respect to all weights. And that's what enables us to train. So we're trying to minimize the loss function J. Um, and one way to do that is to use gradient descent, which is, you know, probably the most straightforward way that we would go about it. Um, 
Uh, we, we actually in practice use stochastic gradient descent, which is just that we take a subsample of our data, pass it through, and then update the weights, and then we take another subsample of the data. This ensures that there's a little bit of scatter uh, in every time we do a weight update. We basically want to optimize the weights. And the reason for that is because if you're stuck in a random, you know, crappy local minima far away, you want to be able to randomly jitter your way out of there. Um, great. So, so you do a weight update, and you can basically choose something called the learning rate, which is just, you know, how much of the update you want to actually propagate to your value. And so you have a very low, and I'm calling this alpha here. If you have a low alpha, it will take you many, many steps to get to where you want to be the bottom of the surface. If you have too high, you know, you can actually take steps that are so large that you actually spiral out of control because the gradient, you know, here is very high and, and you're not sort of in a regime where you can make these giant steps and you will actually basically do worse and worse. And then finally, if you have like somewhere just in the middle, the Goldilocks solution is this alpha parameter will help you get to where you want to be uh, in, in a reasonable amount of time. And so, you know, I, I just did like a really quick, easy simulation where you fit you know, a line to a curve and, and you can see that if you have too high alpha, it, it goes wild, and if it's too low, it just takes forever. But there are sort of good values you know, of alpha that you would want to choose here. I mean, obviously this is a trivial problem, uh, but in terms of high dimensional space, you know, being able to choose a good learning rate is actually something that people have struggled to do for a long time. Uh, because there wasn't a, an obvious heuristic for what makes something a good learning rate. They would just basically train their network for a long time and then see how well it panned out. If it didn't really work so well, they would increase or decrease it at, and then they'll try again. Uh, fortunately, there has, this paper is also really, really important and also underappreciated. Uh, but basically, they, they said that uh, you essentially want to be able to step through your learning rate uh, before you even begin training and sort of exponentially blow up your learning rate and just see the response um, of your, of your uh, loss function as that happens. And so in this case, you basically see that it starts to drop, and then if this were to continue, this actually sort of spikes back up. And there's sort of a, a, a range of reasonable learning rates that you actually do want to select. Um, and so at least empirically, this seems to work really well. I think that people are still trying to figure out you know, if there's a, a, you know, a formal way to select like an optimal learning rate. But for my work, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do what the data tell me to do, and, and this is you know, a really good idea um, in practice. Okay, so uh, in order to basically do deep learning, you really do need to traverse this loss landscape efficiently. You know? And so that's part of the reason why we use residual connections and not just plain old uh, convolutional neural networks with very deep layers, but no skips. Um, we're trying to get down to this global uh, minimum here, or in, in practice it's not going to be a global minimum because, again, in high dimensional space, it's exponentially difficult to find the true global minimum, but you can get to a good enough solution. Uh, but your starting point could be anywhere, and you don't want to fall into random local minima, right? And so, for, uh, I guess it, you can barely see the folds here, but you, if you start off here and you don't use the stochastic process to basically step around this field, then you could imagine getting stuck in local minima that are far away. Um, so, one thing we can do is to, you know, basically step around the, the uh, oh, sorry, this is basically like a standard learning rate schedule where you just, you're learning at a, a, a constant rate or something like that. But you can also do, there are things where you can have cyclical learning rates, where you actually change your learning rate as a function of time, or as a function of number of steps. And so in doing this, uh, what, you're, what you can do is basically settle into uh, a local minimum, or whatever minimum that you find, and then basically increase the learning rate so that you step your way out of it, and then basically, tr basically try to uh, make your way back into another local minimum and hope that you, know, in, in, you do better. And in practice, you actually uh, do significantly better by, by settling into local minima, and then basically in the, in the high dimensional space, you, by increasing the learning rate, you kick out uh, a lot of the parameters that are stuck in saddle points and things like that, and they're able to uh, converge better towards so oftentimes better local minima. And um, one example of this, which is actually from uh, the paper that, uh, that 
published earlier this year is, is, um, is like how uh, the local, basically how the loss is able to continuously do better as you sort of kick the learning rate up. And this is, um, this is the, I guess, the results that I'm going to talk about a little more in a second. Okay, so, right, so this is our goal now. Um, we decided, and when I say we, it's like uh, myself and another postdoc who I enlisted to help it to obtain the data. Um, we uh, have these three color images. They're 128 by 128 pixels. And we basically pass them along through these convolutional layers like we uh, demonstrated earlier. And then eventually we wanted to predict the metallicity of a galaxy. And so a priori, this is not something that is known to be uh, doable. Um, you know, we speculate that there are correlations between like colors and morphologies of galaxies and the metallicity. But you know, as I've shown before, all the metallicity measurements have been made through uh, spectroscopy. And, and which is a very expensive telescope technique. And, and so if we're able to, to make some progress here uh, using just these images and not spectroscopy, uh, then we can actually save a lot of telescope time and do astronomy more efficiently, learn about those galaxies and so. So, uh, it, so I've got here Z-pred and Z-true. These are just the predicted model predictions and the true uh, or the observed really. Uh, gas, you know, the metallicity in the, well, in, inside the galaxies. And then we, we choose to use a root mean squared error loss here, uh, which is shown below. And so then we set out to learn metallicity, uh, if possible. Another thing I should say that we've done is to augment our data set. Uh, you know, we, we know that we have about 130,000 galaxies over which we can train the data, but you can also, you know that there's some sort of invariances which are physically motivated, such as you know, rotation invariance for these galaxies. Um, it doesn't really matter which angle at which you, you observe them, so we can rotate them in sort of random angles as well and, and assign them the same true values. And this makes our model more robust to random biases that we may have, or, or at least it just augments our data set. And using all that optimization tricks that I talked about, you know, we are able to actually, on a single GPU train and and, do, and uh, achieve you know, convergence on our model in only 30 minutes. And um, you know, as a point of comparison, there's, there was another paper that came out, I think, a year before mine, and um, they you know, took 10 days of training on a single GPU to get results that were comparable in nature uh, on very similar data sets. And so I think that like, a lot of these uh, tricks, when added up, they, they really make a, a big difference in terms of being able to uh, to tune and adjust your model accordingly, and then also to be able to respond to it um, and, and you know, accelerate research itself. So GPU is, uh, you own it at Rutgers? Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, so, so this is the, yeah, so this graphics processing unit, okay, so in the beginning, this is fun, I, okay, so I built a gaming computer like five years ago because I thought I would have time to play video games, which I never did. So I just had it lying around, and I was like, and as I started getting into deep learning, I decided, oh, well, I guess I could always repurpose that. Um, it, it, it worked pretty well, and I was able to train these models in about an hour, an hour and a half, but I constantly ran out of memory. So then I went knocking on doors in the physics department, and there was a very nice, uh, well, there were a pair of uh, high energy experimentalists um, so this is David Shee and Matt Buckley in the physics department, and they were kind enough to let me uh, bum their GPU, which was which is this one here, uh, for for a while, and you know enough for us to get the paper out. And then uh, more recently, I've been collaborating with someone at Princeton, and they have a GPU cluster there. So okay, yeah. so you weren't able to do this on your own GPU. I or you were. I could. I, I, I didn't. I didn't basically get to the end of it on my own GPU because of um, the memory issue. Just because of memory issues, yeah, I think I only had like four gigabytes of RAM on that GPU. Um, I think right the current gaming, you know, GPUs not even like you know for the deep learning folks, just just the regular gaming ones are sufficient to do this current analysis pretty well. And you really need um, about ten gigs of RAM is, is what I, at least for the data sets that I was working with. Um, you know, I, it, it saves a bit of time, but it's. It's, it's remarkable, I think, that I could, so I was able to begin training on my, on my GPU at home, and this is like a five-year-old GPU, and so it's, a lot of things have changed since then, so I was pretty impressed that it could, it could even do that. Um, 
but yeah, now now I have access to a cluster, so that makes more sense to use that. And does it take the same amount of time on the cluster? Or? Um, it's I okay. So I've been experimenting with better ways to optimize, and so I've been able to achieve uh, sort of similar performance in about 15 minutes at this point. I, I think that there's obviously a floor. Uh, I don't think you can get like too too much lower than that. Um, but you know, with 130,000 galaxies, and um, you know, this is taking up like 10-ish gigs of RAM. I mean, I I think that you know, I I, I don't know. The, the field is moving very fast. So I don't want to <laughs> make predictions that, that I'll eat back. In fact, I I'd be willing to bet that some somebody's going to come up with ways to to really accelerate you know some of these uh, optimizations even further. Um, but I think that in order, it, like, if I were to just get started today. Uh, and I had like a thousand dollars on hand. I would just buy a you know like an Nvidia uh, or sorry uh, like a GeForce 1080 you know and which is like I don't know five hundred dollars not even and uh, and I'd be able to run probably this model just fine on it um, and uh, I don't know it's 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 really nice that that <laughs> these things exist. Um, you, you don't need a super competing cluster to do these sorts of things anymore. Um, okay, so how did we do? So this is now the training. You know, I did all the updating the errors and adjusting the weights and then, you know, fine tuning and etc. Okay, so these are uh, what the convolutional neural network thinks are the lowest metal SD galaxies on top. And you can see for each I listed the true and the predicted metal cities. And on the bottom you have what the convent thinks are the highest metal SD galaxies. And so if we compare this to sort of just by eye, the heuristics that we saw before, you know, they are morphologically actually quite similar. Like it's, it's learned to do something that, as an astronomer, I have the intuition to be like, oh yes, this is a blue galaxy with like an edge on disk. That's probably low metallicity. Um, and, and thus the, the comet has done the same. And if it's like a redder galaxy, you know, it's probably, you know, at uh, higher metallicity. And then where do we go wrong? So this is also interesting. Uh, if you look at the most underpredicted uh, metal SDs here, basically it thought that um, it should be a low metal SD galaxy, but it turned out to be very high. Instead, it still tried to pick up things that were like kind of bluish. Well, this is bluish. And then these two, these two are funny because I should have cleaned them out of my data before I started trading. Those two are actually quasars that are like extremely distant and they're like not in the same class of objects. So, so it screwed up on, on those, I left them in the paper anyway, just as an example of saying, like, you know, it's we, we may we may not, uh, you know, we, we know that you know there are sort of classes that we don't expect how you know what happens in this case, and in this case, it's uh, it didn't know what to do with them. There's also sort of imaging artifacts in them. I don't know if you can tell, but the colors are kind of messed up there. And then for the over predictions, again, we sort of see that it, it's attributed um, higher metallicity to these like reddish galaxies, but for whatever reason it turns out that these galaxies are actually low in metallicity. Um, and, and I'm not sure why, but they are outliers. Uh, but there are not a ton of these. As you can see, this on the left shows the distribution of the, uh, the true and the predicted metallicities in black and in gold. Um, and so we are we're getting comparable to the underlying distribution, at least for the data, although we are sort of missing this region of, of very high metallicity galaxies. And I think that that's the, the reason for this is because there just are you know an underabundance of them just in the sample. Um, there, you know, if I were to continue in this regard, I would probably think about ways to normalize the data set so that you actually have comparable numbers of those types of galaxies uh, through the like data augmentation techniques that I mentioned before. Um, but overall, here is like the sort of truth versus predictions. And the one-to-one -one line is shown in black here. You can see that for um, for the most part, and especially around sort of where all the data are, which is shown in the histogram below this, uh, we do quite well. And then sort of again, as as you can see from here, you know, if it's like very high metallicity galaxies, then we tend to underpredict them. If they're low metallicity galaxies, you know, we also regress to the mean. And so this is expected, uh, but you know. It's it's interesting that you know we we we're you know not able to basically get away from this at least in this regard, um, but still this root mean squared error of 0 0.085 actually turns out to be 
a really low number. This is a lot, lot lower than, you know, I think any given astronomer would have expected from the get-go. And yeah, what, is the, what is the input again for the? Uh, oh, the inputs. Yeah. Yeah. So the inputs are basically uh, well, these these images right here. So basically, all these sorts of images. There are three channel, 128 by 128 uh, pixel images, and so that you know that is 50,000 data points, right? Three times 128 squared. Uh, so it's a lot, but it's it's not clear that you know the, that the neural network should be trainable, you know, based off of just the pictures, and then the output is just the scalar value. Okay, right, so um, I guess I'm going to fly through this, but basically we wanted to make sure that uh, if we lowered the resolution, we would lose those morphological features that gave semantic meaning in the first place. And, uh, and it turns out that when we look at the predictions and, uh, and we retrain all these, again, because so, we could do it so quickly, um, we see that you know, as image size increases, or basically if we get a lower resolution, these circles here are basically march upward, meaning that you know we're just doing worse and worse. Um, this is the loss function on the, on the y-axis, image size on the right-axis, and so this is sort of our this is how the best that we could do, um, you know, with a full-size image. And then as you sort of yeah, so if you if you compare now this to like a random forest, which is sort of what people not exactly what people were doing, but this is like comparable to the amount of statistical power that we could extract from the integrated light profiles which is what I was saying before we were using uh, to make you know, certain measurements of galaxy properties. Those, that, that basically only gets you down to about 0.14 or so, and this is um, not, not very good. Um, also, always predict the mean. This is basically just the amount of intrinsic scatter in the data set to begin with uh, using this loss function. Um, so this is just a good sanity check showing that, you know, the, the basically getting higher resolution images helps. Um, and therefore, if there are morphological features that are helping us, you know, that are informing us of the metal SC, then, then we want as crisp, you know, a picture as we can get. So now we can go back to this mass metal SC relationship and see how well our predictions do against spectroscopy. And so uh, spectroscopy, again, is the, is the ground truth, right? So there's, that's shown in black here. That's the, the ground truth versus uh, you know, in, in both stellar mass and metallicity. So we take those same stellar mass values and then the images for them, pass them through the convolutional neural network, you know, for a test sample, which we haven't trained on, of course. And then we, we now try to predict the metallicity and see how well these two things correlate. And it's really interesting here because uh, using deep learning, we actually, in some cases, you know, we, we do about as well overall. And then in some cases, basically, this is the scatter now, basically the width uh, in, in the, in basically the 68, uh, you know, whatever, 16th or 84th percentile, the, the scatter actually goes down here. And um, as, as on the same stellar mass things that we were looking at before. And so if you compare this black line to like some of the, the yellow points here, you actually see that we're, we're, you know, exceeding the ground truth in terms of how well it connects with the, uh, the mass metal, or, with the stellar mass. And so this is kind of interesting because from a physics standpoint, we know that the, the gas phase metallicity has to be connected you know, to the stellar mass because it's the same physical process that created them. But it's less clear that the morphology should have any influence on that. Um, and, it's, and what's even less clear is why the scatter for the mass metallicity relationship is, is actually lower when you use the machine learning method than when you use sort of the direct physical ground truth measurement. So this is kind of where, uh, I think this is basically where I'm gonna end off and say that you know, there is a, uh, there's something interesting going on here. You know, if, if we only just care about from the standpoint of data-driven astronomy, we now know that we have a great way to very cheaply get metal listing measurements. And this is not something that's happened before. Um, we can get it just from the three color imaging. And if we had more colors, it, in all likelihood, we'll be able to improve this model. But what is strange is that we are now re reconstructing this mass metal listing relationship with tighter scatter you know, at any given stellar mass in, in metal listing, even though we've trained it imperfectly against that ground truth. 
uh, which is from spectroscopy. So, um, you know, could that be something to do with the way that we parameterize this? Is, is, is there an error in the way that we formulated the model to begin with? Um, I think the jury is still out there. Uh, so I'm just going to leave a summary here basically saying what I just said. Uh, we've done a really good job of training these efficient models um, which can learn quickly and, um, and they're telling us something about how star formation and chemical enrichment in galaxies connect with each other. And so we can accurately predict this for the next generation of astronomical surveys and at the very least use these to immediately uh, get these you know, well correlated, physically correlated measurements of metal as four galaxies. Cool. Thank you. It's very interesting stuff. So, a few more questions about the uh, previous few slides. Sure. So, um, how much more efficient and cheaper than, say, spectroscopy uh, measurements? Yeah, um, it really depends on what types of galaxies you're studying. Um, <laughs> Okay, so basically what's happening is, yeah, I'm just I mean, trying to behind the screen. Oh, okay. This is erasable. So, I mean, effectively what you're doing is you have a galaxy, if you look at the sort of what I'm going to call the flux density, it's the basically the amount of energy you have at any given wavelength. So I'm going to call this flux density, which is usually like a thing. And then this is sort of, let's say, increasing wavelength. So. You, you'll have some galaxy spectrum that looks like this or whatever, and then you'll have these random like little emission lines from various atoms and, and different species in the galaxy. What happens is basically for, uh, for the broadband imaging that I'm showing, these three colors, you're essentially taking these filters that transmit only in certain ranges, and you're basically like saying, okay, these are, you, you know, take, take this, this is for uh, color imaging, right? Take basically take however much light falls through here gives me you know in that pixel uh, some amount of you know some amount of light and whatever. So this is how you get a, a blue, green, and a red channel. And then what you do with spectroscopy is kind of like take this whole thing and then you're just sort of like grading it like this, and you're getting very narrow things. And so you'll be able to pick up all of these lines where they begin and end and things like that. But the trade-off is that the amount of light that you have is, is basically you know, this versus all of this. And so the amount of light that's able to make it through any particular uh, spectral grading or whatever is going to be far smaller. There's, if you have some, so there are some crazy galaxies like these accreting supermassive black holes that have like very detectable emission lines and things like that. But for the most part, what you're going to see is that uh, I think the rule of thumb that I've heard is like about a factor in five in intensity, which translates because uh, sort of time integration, there's, there's kind of a, a square root relationship there. So, so it becomes a factor of 25 uh, less efficient, I guess, if you were to use spectroscopy. Or, or this would be 25 times, I think, the telescope time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, this you can do for like, I think the right now the state of the art, the best facilities you can do like for 400 objects at the same time. More typically, you'll do it for like 10 objects at a time. This you can do for, I don't know, thousands of galaxies. Right. So is it right that the pros of the spectroscopy is it's more fine grained in some way? Yeah. Yeah. And and I and I shouldn't undersell this because you can actually learn a lot of other interesting things about yes. galaxies. Yeah. Um, you can, you know, learn about the kinematics and whatever. Right. But, you know, uh, if, if you're interested in studying the chemical enrichment histories, right. which is a budding field, then, you know, you yeah. can get it for a lot cheaper. Yeah. Sometimes. And the deep learning mm -hmm. will be more coarse grained but more efficient in some ways. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. it also depends on uh, the existing models. So mm -hmm. we have to train deep learning algorithm using previous images, right? That's right. Um, so is it harder to use to study new uh, mechanisms and new phenomena than yeah. they studied before? Yeah, so you're, so this is actually a really good question. And I think, uh, so this is one of the things that um, I'm, I'm writing a bit about and experimenting a bit about. Yeah. Um, the question it, uh, it really becomes, how well can you generalize like other types of telescopes or observations or whatever and, and make predictions on new ones? Um, 
there are some some cases. So I'll say it doesn't work right out of the box. But the question is how many how much data do you need before you can fine tune it and make those adjustments? And preliminary experiments show that you actually don't need very much at all. Um, you can basically there's a very, there are, are straightforward basically like linear transformations usually mm -hmm. or not or not always linear, but there are just some simple transformations that you can get. Uh, and, and in some in some cases, you, you may even be able to, to like transform those images into into basically the equivalent of mm -hmm. this style, and and also uh, work with that. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of two different pathways to go, and uh, mm -hmm. and they both are promising. I see. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, basically, connected to the philosophical question of induction, so okay. how can you use old data to mm -hmm. uh, project new kinds of phenomena and yeah. uh, stuff? So, there's a Bayesian story of Dell, and mm -hmm. deep learning mechanism kind of similar in probabilistic sense. Mm -hmm. You have priors, yes. and priors given by the models already. Yes. So when you don't have new data, then it's hard to learn those new things. Yeah. It's interesting because, uh, so one of the nice avenues that we can go into is to actually simulate mm -hmm. galaxies at extremely high resolution, right. all sorts of different viewing angles and stuff like that. And then we'll be able to sort of forward model all of what we expect to see, right. and then contrast that, and, and train our models there, right. and immediately see, you know, are we predicting the right thing or not? Right. I see. So that's another way to go. Yeah. Yeah. That's very um, helpful. But it's it, it's it's easier in our case because we can now simulate the entire universes, and right. I mean, I don't know how well that would work. In, right. In I philosophy. See. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. I mean, we we can continue. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, well, good to have dinner.